some more definitions and assumptions because we are what we need to do now is we know this guy this is the randomness n bar is the mean of your ith detector at jth angle so this is the randomness right first when we start with this is the randomness that starts your n is a random variable so now what we will say is for simplicity we will assume that nij is independent okay what is happening in one detector or one view need not affect the other one so we'll take this independent assumption which is not that bad okay which is okay assume nij is independent for different measurements and then you say nij equal to n that is it's a same mean is same when will be the mean same number of photons that are coming through when will it be same oh if i have a homogeneous medium then i can expect whatever i sent in and whatever i receive in each of the detector for different views at least for within one view right if it's a symmetric object it's a circle then for all the views they all have to be the same value right on an average the average value why because it's a homogeneous attenuation in such a case we can it's okay for 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 the purposes of understanding what all factors play a role this is not a limiting um uh, you know assumption so we can always start with signal to noise ratio when we do we always talk about homogeneous medium you have many measurements what is the fluctuation if the signal itself is changing right if you have inhomogeneity then it becomes you have to segregate difficult different locations and see whether the signal and noise are correlated so to make life easy right this is something that is routinely used so it's not that bad okay so this is the assumption so we can essentially talk about doesn't matter which detector which view angle the mean is independent of that okay so you can use only one n bar again cl this uh, filter function for simplicity otherwise you'll have to have hamming window or hanning window you'll have to have another exponential or whatever to describe that to make life easy we will say this is a rectangular window so that uh, you know uh, less of a confusion but the idea is you can have you can change this okay but for simplicity we will say this is a rectangular window okay so this is for the fundamental n that is going in this is the filter function then what is there oh then there is a g right that goes in so g operates on this and that is the one that goes into the back projection algorithm so your g because of this we can also assume g are also independent okay just this is okay we'll say for for the purposes this is fine if we were able to live with that with n g is random just because of n and therefore this is fine g is also independent okay uh then the point is we need to get mean and variance of your mu your image that is what we want so we can derive this you start with the convolution back projection right that is your algorithm you have the input random variable you have this one implemented as rectangular so if you substitute and work out based on the assumptions of uh, uh, independence right there are few steps the, even in the text it's not a detailed derivation but there are couple of more steps that are given after these assumptions and essentially you you get a uh, expression for your variance okay so what is this uh, so the detail of these derivations are not that important for the context of this course so even in the textbook only uh, a, a couple of uh, you know uh, equations are given just before this uh, to capture it and there uh, and this is okay why we want we don't want to get into the complicated uh, derivation because already it's simplified in the real context when you are working in it you have to be very diligent but here the objective for us is to understand the factors and relate to our instrumentation in physics so we will not go into the details 
but essentially this is an expression that you get by making these assumptions and starting out with the um, discretized approximation of your convolution back projection. So, this is the variance you get. What is interesting here is this variance is a, a function directly related to your rho naught. What is this rho naught? Oh, this is your, uh, you do your filter, right? That is your highest cutoff of your filter, filtered back projection, right? So, this has to do with your cutoff of your filter and uh, your m is, we saw previous, is the discretization, right? So, more the m, m is the angular discretization. So, more the m you have, oh, more the m I have, less the variance, less the noise. Oh, okay, more I sample, I have less noise, right, less variance, intuitive. Okay, what is this? Oh, higher cutoff. So, if I have higher cutoff, I have higher noise. Why? Oh, if your cutoff is more, probably high frequency features are coming. So, noise, lot of noise in the high frequency are coming in and therefore, you can expect the more the cutoff, maybe after some time your feature is not there, but your high frequency noise is coming in. Okay. So, you have to be careful about how much high frequency you want to uh, provide the cutoff. And then uh, you have these guys. What is your n dashed or oh, average number of photons, which we kind of know. Oh, increase the number of photons. You shoot more photons, right? If you shoot more photons, you will reduce the variance, which we knew from before. But downside is there, right? You do not want to send too much n. So, if you send high energy, for example, you will increase n. It will not interact much, it will come out. So, we talked about that. So, again, it is not one way street. And then n dashed by t. So, this t is actually in the numerator. So, what does this say? What was your t? t was your width, right? Your, your detector. It has to do with the detector. Okay. So, uh, so, this is basically if you the way it is written here number of photons per detector. If you increase the number of photons per detector, your noise will reduce. That is what that is how it is written, that is why it is written like this. Okay, fine. So, we can talk about the different variables and how it influences increases or decreases. Increase in the cutoff and T detector spacing, right. These all increase your uh, noise. Noise decreases when you have these two. Increased sampling, right? You, you have more finer views and more number of photons. Okay. So, so much for your noise. But we are not really interested in noise in isolation. What are we interested? We are interested in signal to noise ratio. Okay. So, signal to noise ratio, what is our signal? What definition we, oh, we will use the similar definition, mean to standard deviation, right. We talked about mean as your signal and the variation around the mean is your noise, right. So, we talked about signal to noise ratio as mean to standard deviation, mean of your attenuation coefficient. So, it is mu bar, standard deviation. So, sigma of your mu, mu estimate, this is your signal to noise ratio in a traditional sense. However, we talked about this local differential signal to noise ratio when we covered image quality. So, it is also common that because our interest is in looking at image contrast, the signal to noise ratio can also include your C which is contrast. So, it is a differential contrast. So, differential signal to noise ratio is what we are practically interested, right. And so, the C is nothing but your differential contrast, fraction change of mu from mu bar. So, we covered this differential SNR when we divide, divide, you know, talked about your image quality, introduction to image quality. So, go look at that 
portion if you want to know what we have done here. So, this is your differential signal to noise ratio. Why? Because we want to talk about this contrast that is that is interesting. Okay. So, that is your SNR. So, now what we need to do is identify this is a big picture definition. So, what do we know? Oh, we know what the noise is. Mean is not a big deal. Mean is just mu bar. This guy, that is a problem. What is the variance? Right? We had a variance derived right in the previous slide. We will have to substitute that here. So, when we substitute and rearrange, you get signal to noise ratio to be C by, of course, what we had was variance, we will have to take a square root. So, you get this square, square root here. So, C mu bar by square root of sigma square, right. So, you get this pi square root of 3 by 2 m by, so whatever was your directly proportional, inversely proportional, right, that is kind of changed here slightly because we wrote this as in the denominator before, at least the way we wrote it. Okay. So, what does this say? This says, okay, I am interested in signal to noise ratio and how am I affected? Fundamentally, this is important, right? Fundamentally, C is important. If there is not much differential signal there, maybe you are not going to see much, but let us not worry about that. So, this is a part that is important, but then it is this part that is going to affect for whatever you start with this is the guy that is going to affect you. Okay. So, how do you design? What are the things that are in your control to do a good design so, the, so as to get maximum SNR? Right? Things that you have in control is, oh, we talked about this cutoff. So, what could be the cutoff that we want to use? Well, without mentioning explicitly, you already know we are talking about discrete implementation and this is kind of a uh, right, your your uh, cutoff for this filter. So, where do you, how much frequency do you allow, right, especially the highest frequency, that is the question. So, what do you do? Oh, when you have discretization, some filtering, the first concept that comes to your mind is anti-aliasing filter, right. You should have the filter such that, so that when you do, you have the Nyquist criteria is met, right? You have to have at least twice the max highest frequency. Otherwise, you will have aliasing, which we will talk about aliasing also as a artifact. But, but uh, so here is your control. So you could essentially design your cutoff so that it can serve as an anti-aliasing filter. So you you cut off the highest frequency, whatever you want to allow. Right? After that, you digitize. So your anti-aliasing filter, you can have your rho naught to be k by w, where essentially your w is the width of the scanner. So, if you can design it like this, then you can minimize at least the artifact and you can uh, get a good signal to noise ratio. Okay. So, that is fine. So, when you substitute that, right, when you substitute that condition, you can reduce this further to because you had some values here, right. So, we can reduce it to 0.4 because your row naught is substituted, right, in terms of uh, k and w, w is the width of the scanner. So, k and t, k is approximately equal to 1. So, it is in terms of t. So, you, you can do this part and you get 0.4 k c mu right w square root of this guy. So, the idea is this is your signal to noise ratio, differential signal to noise ratio. So, you can quickly look at this and convince yourself if I want to have good signal to noise ratio, the good contrast, I have to increase my m. I have to increase my n, but there is a square root. 
that is the important factor okay so it's not just if i want to double this snr i have to quadruple this so you see the i mean in some sense this is intuitive but then uh, explicitly putting it makes it uh, compelling to take that look okay so that is what that is so we'll oh that is for parallel beam so you can do the similar thing for your fan beam when you do it for fan beam you can talk about n suffix f as a number of photons count per fan and d is your number of detectors and l is the length of the detector array so there is a slight change in the formulation because of this so your snr is 0.4k c mu l n of m by d cube okay so your n is your mean is your nf by d and w is your l by d length of the detector array by number of detectors is going to give you your width per detector okay so this is uh, fine for fan beam you get some similar things like this so snr decreases as d increases this is something that is right d increases snr decreases d is number of detectors so this is something that is not intuitive you would have expected if you have more number of detectors you have more measurements so you will probably get less noise at least because you are averaging and uh, uh, right you are reconstructing using more number of independent random variables you would expect that the variance would have reduced and therefore your signal to noise ratio will improve but that's not happening it turns out that the d is the denominator so it says that this snr decreases as d increases why would that be right oh what assumptions did we make in parallel ray we said neighboring neighbors don't disturb each other independence whereas it turns out in fan beam the convolution of the projection right you have this uh, ramp filter that kind of couples uh, noise between the adjacent detectors so because of that your detectors are not say so the neighboring ones are not independent so there is a coupling that is taking place and therefore the noise between the detectors is coming into picture so this effectively increases the noise so more the number of detectors in this configuration the detectors interference is there and therefore your um, noise is going up okay of course you can do larger d is desired why d is the number of detectors so if you have many number of detectors right then each one will be small that means my resolution is good so it's always a trade off that's the problem in most of the modalities that's always a trade off but then if you understand enough of how each parameter is affecting which are conflicting which are favorable then you talk with the clinical practitioner you talk with the engineer on site you you kind of work out a agreeable trade off it's always about negotiating an agreeable trade off that's the important uh, you know practical aspect that you will find in all of these okay good so so much for snr so what do we want to do we talked about resolution we talked about noise noise not in isolation noise in the context of snr not just that snr for fan beam also so now we are good to proceed further just before that in fact i won't solve this just to appreciate right so that you can relate all the parameters we talked about so far consider a fan beam ct system right with one source let's not deviate much from what we know so you have d detectors m angles and a image size is also given j by j so here you are treating the d equal to m equal to j equal to 256 so it's a 256 cross 256 image <coughs> so you have taken 256 views and in each view you have 256 uh, detector measurements so now assume that the width of each detector is 0.25 centimeters so 2.5 mm okay 
and you are using a ramp filter rectangular window so we will not complicate that why ok so we have also designed it such that it is 1 by d it is anti aliasing so we are designed that with the cutoff that is equal to 1 by d d is 0 0.25 which is your width of the detector ok so now you are using the scanner to measure a, a, a lesion right so, the contrast between the lesion and the surrounding tissue right is 0 0.005 or so this is not the, the scanner is used to image a lesion with a contrast embedded in water. So, the surrounding is water ok. So, your water ok you have your mu bar average this thing is also given. So, now the question is Okay, given this setup, this is what I want to do. You are given a constraint. Oh, I want to do the imaging, but subject to at least 20 dB I need to make any diagnosis. Only then I will be confident in saying that is a lesion is whatever it is there and I can I can do follow up. So, if you if we require the image to have SNR of at least 20 dB, what is the minimum number of photons per projection? Right. So, now it goes back to your settings. So, you based on your signal to noise ratio desired, you are going to come up with the exposure. So, what is the question is what will be that? What is the minimum number of photons per projection that you need? How will you go about? Right? So, first and foremost, you are given a requirement for SNR in dB. But what we derived in the previous uh, slide, you had SNR as a ratio. So, first thing that you can do is convert this dB to ratio. How is that done? Oh, 20 log of right SNR log base 10 right. So, go. So, first thing you can get SNR alone, not in dB. What will be that? if it is 20 dB, right? Right. So, this will be the ratio. So, that will be log of 10 by 10, 20 log of 10 by 10 in dB. So, if it is ratio is 10, log 20 log base 10 of 10 will be 20 dB, right? So, SNR will is 10. Okay, so I know my SNR. What do I? Uh, what else do I know? Oh, I need to get number of photons per projection. Okay, so I know my SNR. So that is signal and noise ratio. So I have some formulation for noise, right? Sigma square. I have some formulation that you can quickly look through in the previous slide. So I have that. Then, uh, of course. This SNR is what? You, you go by your formula, you had C times mu bar, correct? C times mu bar by sigma of mu hat. This is what is the definition. So, I have my C that is given. I have my mu bar that is given. What is that? Oh, we have some formulation for that, but that you can measure from here from the given information. So, if you can measure sigma mu hat, I can estimate sigma square. What is sigma square? Oh, that you can look into your formulation from before, right? So, sigma square is 2 pi uh, square by 3 your rho naught cube t by m n dashed bar. N bar. So, look back to your previous slide, you will see this formulation. So, I can calculate my sigma from here. So, I can calculate the sigma square. So, I know this. What else do I know? Oh, now I have the right hand side, several of, several of which I know. I know m, I know t, I know cutter, cutoff frequency. This is just 2 pi square. Ah, and I know left hand side. So, I can get my n bar ok. So, you can go 
do that but what is asked is what is asked is where is the uh, photons per projection per projection so if i have uh, d detectors then i will have to multiply with the d for one projection if i get n then i have to multiply with d okay so you can actually work that projections per thing is n dashed into d n dash you can get from here so you can calculate this just go do this it's not uh, it's it's just substitution after this okay so you will get some number like 1.87 into 10 power 8 that's your that's your minimum right minimum number of photons okay so the objective is not so much on the calculation the details of how you punch the calculator about how we understand the question appreciate that okay if uh, if there is a requirement constraint from the end user on the acceptable image quality how do we work our way around because this is important right based on this answer you are going to acquire ask the technician to acquire the image so that you can make a diagnosis so you should you should know the end requirement and how that controls the data acquisition settings this is the important so, in the context of covering the physics, instrumentation and image quality, I hope you will be able to swiftly go back and forth and understand how to connect all the three concepts. Most of the time, it will be from the end user, some requirement will be there so from the image side. So, how do we go from that and see if we can improve it? Is there a fundamental improvement possible? If possible, then how do we acquire that at a uh, at a fundamental level so the raw data itself you have to acquire using that insight using that condition okay so that's so much for our signal to noise ratio and how we can use the information of setting and um, your context of recon right to calculate those so now what we need to do is uh, artifacts okay so we talked about uh, noise but in the image, artifacts are also distractors okay, that confuse the doctors from the actual object that they are trying to understand. If there is something that is distracting them, that is a no-no. So, it is not a noise per se, but then it is a distractor. Okay. So, it has to be reduced. So, where all can artifacts come from? So, in the process that we have done so far, First and for very easy to spot from our backgrounds is, oh, your discrete location. So, the continuous function, so your, your distribution is continuous, right? I mean, but then I am making these measurements at discrete locations. In fact, I am doing two discretizations. One is the view angle. The other is the detector, the, the, the number of detectors, each one is separate, right? Along the L, it is discrete along the the view angles that is also discretized so we already saw that so how do we arrest that so that is going to be your sampling whenever you have a sampling you have to worry about aliasing so how do you reduce this aliasing you have to do right you have to do anti-aliasing filter so in some sense aliasing if you are not sampling if you are sampling less than the Nyquist rate, what is that? Twice the highest frequency content that is there. Right? If you are sampling any less than that, you are going to get aliasing. How, that means what? Oh, your high frequency content might be wrapped into your low frequency. So, you might, right? That will be the uh, effect. So, how do you avoid that? We need to do some anti-aliasing. So, in, in this case, um, how okay so that means highest frequency so the highest frequency if you can apply this filter with some cutoff f of f max before you disk right then you sample then you are ensuring that the wrapping around is not taking place so in our context we were talking about number of projections right number of projection angles 
so if you actually you can do this so you 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 throw some angles right you you start with it you get several projections but then in your sinogram right you have all the angles just throw some angles do the reconstruction using only say every other step size or every fourth step size and you will start to see the effect okay so you, what what do you mean by effect is you will vividly see this as a street as streak artifacts right you will you will see the it won't be smooth it will have lines okay so you will see streak artifact in fact we will just uh, show the image and you will recognize the streak artifact but from before also we did this but now what is expected is when you see that you know where it is coming from first time when we showed streak artifact i said we'll cover it later but now hopefully you should be able to visualize the effect and say ah i know where this is coming from this is because i have discretized so if i go back and change the number of angles i should see the the streak pattern changing right so you should be able to do that um of course in some sense uh, already the detector right because it is a area detector it's not a point detector it is it is averaging out so it is already having some effect implicitly some pre filtering is happening okay averaging is kind of your low pass right so it's already doing that to some extent so here is a example of the variation of your uh, uh number of angle number of projections right and samples per projection so you can notice that i mean even this is actually pretty um, you know you see one object here at the center which is supposed to be the case but you notice this star right so you can have this star artifact people say and in fact when we talked about also we talked about uh, when this can happen when you have sampling under sampling but we didn't really tell what it is now you know under sampling means in the context of either you can under sample in the views or you can under sample in the number of projections in that views right number of detector elements in that views so either case has its own effect and you see the see the aliasing when they say okay you can see the effect okay so this is streak artifact then what are the other things that we talked about before oh this is streak artifact due to sampling that is one effect what is the other effect in our recon we assumed we like assume something about the energy we used mono energetic in fact when we sent energy in we already said unlike uh, projection in ct we are going to said hardened beam what did we mean by hardened beam or beam hardening that means the narrowing right that's what we said so we we said that when you do beam hardening the spectral spread is reduced you give only a narrow and therefore mono energetic is fine or at least reasonable and therefore all our reconstruction algorithm used this assumption of mono energetic right but then that is not entirely true because beam hardening can also happen after you do all that and you send it into the body what you get at the detector right it is still the beam hardening is also happening but then it can be amplified depending on what material is on its path if you have a strong absorber right so then uh, strong absorber at that frequency then you are going to have behind that part you are going to have a different spectra so what enters is already a hardened beam but then due to the interaction the, the you know the energy is lost right but then if you have some strong attenuator in the path those locations you can have attenuated uh, effect right and that will kind of uh, or what the preferentially absorbed that we know so this could actually come back into the image so reconstruction algorithm we assume this but when you have effect of the beam hardening showing up then artifact results so typically where do you have these effects prominent okay we talked about bone so so it depends on the location for example so if you take a head scan you have a bone skull and then you have soft 
brain right so the attenuation is kind of different there and therefore when you have something like this the amplification or the 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 uh, hardening of the beam is drastic because of the bone that is hitting and you have to penetrate the bone before you go into the brain right so whatever you send from out which is supposed to be beam hardened beam compared to your projection radiography it's already a hardened beam but then when it goes through the skull your bone is attenuating far more and then you get the behind that you get your soft uh, brain brain tissue so in such cases you have lot more predominant effect of your so beam hardening artifact so this is kind of a tricky artifact somebody who is working in the domain uh, they have done lot of scans they understand the organ they they, they may know, so they have to now work on the dose they have to try to reduce this okay so they they know what to interpret what is a beam hardening artifact so this is a tricky artifact though right so you could get this artifact in other regions also i mean this is a head scan but you could get it at other locations also right abdomen for example so it depends so if you have a bullet <laughs> right i mean somebody gets shot if there is a implant it's a different material so there you have to be very careful in its interpretation beam hardening artifact and uh, so your sampling beam hardening what else did we talk about when we talked about uh, introduction to artifacts so when we come to ct these are very prominent and then you have your you have a detector regular electronics is there electronic drift all those things are there but more importantly we have detectors if one of the detector goes bad right what does that mean oh that means it is whatever it is going to have always have a zero value right what does that mean oh physically that means everything that came in along the line of sight is attenuated absorbed by the body so it is going to say a very high attenuation value will be projected along that path okay but then what is the thing oh you are going to rotate right different angles you are going to do but the detector is a uh, malfunctioning detector so every rotation wherever that detector is there along that line of the detector it is going to project back and say this is high attenuation everything is absorbed in the medium right so when you organize it in theta and some what is going to happen you get what is called as a ring artifact so the size of the ring right so it's pretty more prominent here i think you can you can see the effect what is the so the size of the ring for example could tell you the radius of the ring could tell you which element from the iso center right center of the detector right you have the source you have the center and then its width so if a detector is gone bad the location of the detector from the iso center right from the center of the detector that radius you will see the ring okay so ring artifact is again something that uh, they can spot i mean it's not really a pattern that is there inside you can have so Uh, not a pattern but at least one ring if it is there is it a circular lesion or some circular growth or is it because of malfunction again domain expertise and experience comes into picture but this is kind of a very if you get nice circular symmetric you know all likelihood it is going to be because of your reconstruction algorithm you projected it back based on the theta for full 360 degrees so you're going to get likely that it is an artifact nature is beautiful but maybe it's too too good to believe that you have a perfect concentric circles that are coming in the object okay again some amount of domain knowledge is important but this is these are fairly understood well okay so one another common thing is your motion artifact so we talked about different generations and the time also i kind of cautioned you so if you have motion during the data acquisition you cannot do much 
right you are going to project that back and so motion artifact is common most of the times uh, you have to rescan okay there are subtle times for example so the, here for example you have to rescan but the advantage but it depends on so it's a it's a anatomical image if you want here right you can ask put a fixture and have the head stable but for example if you are going to do a ct uh, of your heart right it is always going to move there is going to be so one is fundamentally you have to do high frame rate but after that what do you do if if if, if you want to see some dynamics that is moving much more than your frequency of uh, temporal frequency right your your scan frequency what do you do well say for example car, uh, heart what they do is you have what is called as ecg gating right so they can they can have the ecg and they can collect the data and then go back synchronize it with the ecg and say okay every time right this data we got next time also at that location only i got i will synchronize it with what they call as ecg gated that is one common way they try to do it so you do multiple acquisitions over different cycles and then go back synchronize it with the ecg which is very good temporal resolution and then take only those frames that are all in certain time interval in the cycle that you want okay so that is one common way they do to so to reduce motion artifact here vivid artifacts is fine you rescan but sometimes intrinsic when you are really dealing with intricate uh, um, organs where there is a motion but you would still like to look at the image without motion because you want to measure the thickness of the the valve right if you have blurring and the thickness is because of the blur is certain value you will lose out so you, you so there are critical applications where you may want to minimize the motion blurring and the motion is not because of your outside motion that is controlled it could be inside breathing you can hold to some extent heart is a good example it is going to do its job so motion artifact uh, there are ways to correct it but this can be corrected at the at the at the acquisition stage so to just summarize what we have covered in the whole idea module of x ray ct x ray computed tomography we started with parallel projection reconstruction okay and that is a simple intuitive paradigm to understand so where we talked about back projection summation first this is the intuition way just project back the average sum but then we kind of made it little more formal because the image were blurry we we started looking at mathematical correctness and then we noticed there is a projection slice theorem and that projection slice theorem uh was a fourier method but then we said this is not that popular most popular is your filtered back projection but filtered back projection also if you have to implement it, 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 you know it's, it's the, you have to do couple of frequency it sh, you know go from fourier domains back and forth so more practical one would was convolutional back projection so you do your convolution in the spatial domain right so it's also filtering then we talked about fan beam projection and reconstruction so here what the take home message was it's very similar to what we had before only thing is start to imagine there was what is 1 by d d dash square so that adds a weight so you start to think as weighted back projection otherwise it's a back projection only okay uh, same filtered back projection but you have one more 1 by d square term so that is your weighted for the distance from your source to that point then we talked about image quality in the image quality we talked about blurring and the blurring introduced due to your filtering the non ideal filter and the area detector not a point detector there is a area detector and therefore we introduce that as the blurring that introduces a blurring effect and so we talked about this and the equivalent filter that you can get for the blurring 
be obtained using inverse Hankel transform H of R, right? So this is something that we did and then we talked about noise. In the noise we talked about not just noise, noise in the context of differential signal to noise ratio and we talked about how the factors, some of the factors that are influencing this to be the X-ray intensity, number of view angles, number of angles per right, number of uh, samples per angle and your filter cutoff, anti-aliasing and we also talked about different artifacts. Okay. So, I think uh, uh, this is a, like I said, this is supposed to be a introductory material for this module because we are covering different modalities. But what we covered here is fairly at a level where if you understand this and you have some self-learning motivation because you are working in this area or you plan to work in this area or you have worked with some image processing of you know CT and you would like to understand more, I think you are, you, you will be able to catch up to the state of that in quick time after you start to work on this, do some programming of implementation of the recon, that, that will be a, a suggested uh, strategy to master this material. Okay. So, thank you.